Hi, everybody. I'm delighted to have another edition of my Meet the Experts chats. And I'm really, really pleased to have Bill Taylor on today. Um, Bill has been working in pelvic health for a number of years, shall we say. Sure, <laughs> fine wine. <laughs> fine wine. <laughs> say that. <laughs> um, and I put out a call on social media the other day saying that I was going to be chatting to Bill about pelvic health and athletes. And we got some really interesting questions in. So we're just going to have a chat about those and some troubleshooting and just hear Bill's pearls of wisdom, which will be multiple, I'm sure. And uh, yeah, we'll take it from there. So, Bill, thanks so much for joining us. Do you want to just fill folks in a little bit about your background, where you're from, what you do? Sure. Well, thanks for having me, Michelle. It's, uh, it's been a busy week for me this week. So this is the last thing I'm doing before the weekend. And then I'm going to put my feet up. Uh, so I've been a physio for oh, longer than I can remember, probably 38 plus years, maybe 36. I can't remember. Anyway, long time. And uh, I've been working uh, with dancers for the last 24 years. I've been doing pelvic floor stuff. I did pelvic girdle stuff before I did pelvic floor stuff because I trained with Diane Lee in, in Vancouver. And then I've been doing, since I came back to Edinburgh, which is over 20 years ago, I've been seeing pelvic floor patients. So it's a, a long, long time. Um, I'm, I'm currently the consultant physiotherapist at Scottish Ballet. Uh, I work with... Um, I have my own clinic, run it in Edinburgh, big pelvic floor, 50% of the stuff I see is pelvic floor. Still do a lot of MSK. Uh, I look after the dancers at Scottish Dance Theatre, which is Scotland's kind of contemporary uh, dance company. Uh, I work with, I've been quite passionate for a while about empowering young dancers to take control of their bodies and to have the knowledge to understand how their bodies work. And um, when I first started in dance, there's a lot of myth there's a lot of um, unscientific uh, kind of practices that, that, that were going on. And so it's been kind of my, my kind of passion really to change that over the years. And I've been super lucky, uh, worked with some incredible artistic directors and some incre incredible company directors at Scottish Dance Theatre and Scottish Ballet who really understood the benefit of um, physiotherapy when it came to looking at, at dancers. So, and, and the pelvic floor stuff and the dance thing kind of goes together it kind of you know it kind of gels together quite well and um it, i think the, the big thing i suppose when i went when i was in canada i did my manual therapy qualification and and the canadian system of orthopedic medicine is very focused on movement mm -hmm. so when i started seeing dancers the biggest thing that i realized was that they were all about movement that was their whole being and um, so the way I worked, really, it, it, we got along well. You know, I, 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 made, I showed them things to do. I got them better and they liked what I did. And, uh, and, and that was it, really. And I, and I never really looked back. And, and, uh, I, and I think I've learned a lot. Most of the stuff I know about dance, I've honestly learned from dancers. I mean, they're amazing uh, people. They, they know their body so well that it, it's like my maxims always be listen to your patients because they'll tell you what's wrong with them. And dancers are especially good at telling you in minute detail yeah. exactly what's going on with them. So, yeah, no, I've, I've, I've loved uh, my time in dance. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a challenging place to work because uh, there's lots of pressure. Oftentimes, I worked with a lot of... Um, my very, very first job was with uh, Riverdance. Oh, wow. <laughs> believe it or not, uh, in Edinburgh when they were here for three months. And that was a bit of a baptism of fire. Mm -hmm. So I've not just done ballet, I've done uh, co commercial dance. I've worked with uh, like the cast of Les Mis, Phantom, all the West End shows that come traveling. Mm -hmm. I've been lucky enough to work with uh, like Carlos Acosta, uh, wow. um, Bathsheba Dance Company from uh, Tel Aviv. Uh, some, some, uh, j just lots of, real, just super lucky to work with some really good people. So yeah, that's me. And, uh, and then that's how I end up probably sitting here chatting to you today because everyone thinks I'm an expert and I just think it's just my job and I just get on with it so yeah know. but you know what I think um I think you're underselling yourself here a little bit because I think you know you're bringing a lot of different tools into the mix as well and I love what you're saying about really having that mix of MSK and pelvic health because like you know I think it's, it's Carolyn Van Dyken all, always talks about how pelvic health is basically orthopedics in a cave yeah. and to be able to zoom mm. out and look at the whole person <laughs> Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. it's, it's a really important thing as well to, to emphasize to people that dancers are hardcore athletes. They 100%. are like 
mm. so focused, uh, you know, and people mm. sometimes think, oh, you know, ballet, you know, easy, jumping about the place uh, in a tutu. Those dancers have a work. I mean, any, you know, I've just, I've dabbled in the work of dance physio and mm -hmm. the work ethic of dancers, particularly at a higher level is just phenomenal. What they put their, what they're prepared to put their bodies through. Um, mm -hmm. And again, that, that deep self-knowledge that you have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What would you say are the most common types of of issues that you're dealing with with dancers, not just from a pelvic health perspective, you know, although that's sure. primarily what we're going to be talking about, but but just kind of sure. big picture wise. I mean, I'm presuming a lot of, of lower limb, feet, ankles, which of mm -hmm. course is going to tie into pelvic health as well. Of course. Um, I think um, if we're not just talking about ballet, if we're talking, I mean, ballet is a kind of particular form of dance and it's very specific, it's very stylized. And, and the injuries in there can often be, you know, often lower limb. Um, whereas contemporary uh, dancers tend to use rolling about on the floor. They're not always on their feet. They don't wear shoes. Um, there, there's maybe a lot more contorted, less um, uh, kind of stylized movements that happen. Um, and so, uh, so you get different injuries in, in different types of dance. And, and I've worked a lot with hip hop dancers and stuff. And again, they get they get a lot of neck problems because they're spinning on their heads. And um, so it's. Um, I think the the broadest picture is that you either get um, traumatic injuries or you get overuse injuries, mm -hmm. and and it depends on so traumatic injuries. I wouldn't say is always the case, but often happen during performance when you're maybe on the stage, you cast a band into the wind, you give it your all, you're trying to get your best aesthetic performance out. Right? So you might slip, sprain your ankle. Whereas the kind of what tends to happen is. With uh, with rehearsals and, and 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 learning choreography, is you repeat the same thing over and over and over again multiple times, and that repetition can give a repetitive kind of strain to different tissues. And if you're not strong enough, or if it's a movement that you're not used to, you're practicing to get it better, and that kind of that kind of repetition can cause overuse. And so then it's all about too much load and how much load has been put on, and how, and what do we do about those things? So. I think, um, I, I would say one of the things that's changed big time and Scottish Ballet is the place I can speak mostly about because we now have a program there where there's been a massive shift um, over the last 10 or 15 years, maybe 20 years, looking, dancers never used to do weight training. Mm. They used to get fit for the dance they were doing by rehearsing. And now there's kind of a move towards looking at the choreography that might be coming along, um, finding out what, that involves from a kinesiology, kinesiological point of view yeah. and then putting them in the gym and giving them Olympic type weightlifting proper um, scientifically based weight training programs uh, to strengthen the muscles that they're going to need for the upcoming performances and rehearsal so that we're trying to make them strong before they get into the rehearsal and we're trying to minimize and cut off the overuse things at the pass really. Um, and, and, you know, that there was a, a study done by the Australian National Valley uh, a while ago looking at um, uh, ankle sprains. And at that point, everybody, if you went into a dance studio at that time, everyone's standing around. They're all, they're all stretching their calves because they can't ever be long enough. But they, they have to have loose calves, loose calves. That's what I need. And they found that if, if they just stopped them stretching their calves and gave them strengthening exercises, they decreased the ankle injury by 40%. So... It was a big eye opener to all of us in the dance industry to say, you know, because dancers are a little bit, um, you know, they're, they're, I would say they're focused on stretching. Yeah. Um, and But when you actually ask them why they're doing it, they, they don't really need the length they've got because they're already hypermobile. They're already where they need to be. So for them to go and stretch, it was almost more of a ritual yeah. than a change in physiological tissue length. So I think... Um, Certainly, I, I've been teaching at the at Edinburgh University. I teach on a, an MSc program there on dance education and science. And for the last ten years, I've been, you know, spouting the story of listen, you, you probably don't need to stretch the way you're doing, you know. And in actual fact, flexibility is more about control, balance, and coordination, rather than about not just about extensibility of muscle fibers. Mm -hmm. So I think that you know, we, we, the, the 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 two groups are are um, overuse. And and um, and traumatic, and it depends on, and, and there'll all be different injuries depending on which type of dance. I think so. For example, the girls in ballet tend to be lower legs, 
Uh, they can also be ribs when they're lifted by the boys, they allow rib compression. Um, they can also have the, the boys shoulder problems, mm -hmm. neck problems perhaps, because they're lifting the girls a lot. And then also they do, they're the guys that the guys kind of um, show off a bit in the show, it tends to be big jumps across the stage and lots and lots of footwork. So they might well do something to their knee. Um, but definitely, I mean, if I, when I used to go through to Glasgow to work in the, uh, in the, at the headquarters of Scottish Valley, if I showed up on a, an afternoon to run a clinic and I might have 20 people in my clinic, mm -hmm. I would probably see um, 80 to 90% of them would be feet. Yeah. You know, so that it, so week on week on week, it would definitely be feet problems. Like you'd have bunions, metatarsalgia, um, and dancer's heel, which is posterior impingement of the calcaneus, um, hamstring problems. So they just, you know, the whole gambit really of of kind of sports injury low limb kind of issues. Yeah. So I want to just circle back to something that you said there about um, how most dancers um, would have hypermobility issues. Yeah. Now, what I'd love to know is, do you see that playing out in terms of pelvic health? Because we know there's a, there's a crossover, isn't there, between hypermobility yeah. and, mm -hmm. and pelvic health. And then I'm also interested in your thoughts about red S in dancers as well. Okay. And how that's okay. going to play out hormonally. Because, of course, yeah. that's going to have an effect not only on pelvic health and menstrual health, mm -hmm. but on bone mm -hmm. health. So mm -hmm. you've got two mm -hmm. hours, go. <laughs> <laughs> two days. <laughs> So, so I think the thing that happens is dancers are often. Uh, let, let's maybe talk about ballet dancers because because we could really talk about yeah. loads of different dance forms. But let's just stick with that because it's what I know most about. And it, I mean, and I would say that those guys often have been dancing since they've been two years old. And what happens is as they grow up, and if if their if they, their joints get stiffer, so as as kids you have. The most flexibility we could fold you up into a, into a cube and put you in a box and as we get a bit older our flexibility diminishes our collagen changes we lay down bone in different ways our cartilage gets thicker we have embryological fusion of bone or we have we have chronological fusion of, of, of uh, cartilage and bone so bones become more ossified and that limits our range of motion and if that if you don't then on top of that have a kind of a on some spectrum of, of hypermobility or if you're at the upper end of the mobility spectrum then your ability to perform ballet becomes more restricted mm -hmm. so what will tend to happen is as kids as you and they find it harder mm -hmm. and the harder they find it they tend to kind of almost self-select not to continue mm -hmm. because either they'll be the, the the actual techniques will cause them discomfort or maybe perhaps injury and depending on you know and there's there's lots of different qualities of dance teachers in schools so you might get the wrong input and that might end up causing some issues as, as well so um and i'm being careful what i say here because i don't want to diss any dance dance teachers because dance teachers have come on massively in the last number of years you know they're very highly educated and know exactly what they're doing a lot of them so I think what happens is that there comes a point when when you get to a it, it's really only the, the people who have um, strength and mobility and, and an absolute determination to make it that get to the high who, who get employed in companies because it's it's a I mean you, you're probably some of these kids are maybe dancing seven days a week you know it, it, it interferes with their life you know they can't have um, it maybe the, all their friends have to be dancers because there's no time to do anything else. They don't get to be involved in other sports. Um, you know, they're, they're at school, so that their lives are super busy. It's also quite expensive. So there's a whole kind of, there's a whole bunch of social factors, ecological factors that play into this. And then there comes a point of, you know, going to dance school isn't, isn't cheap. So what you get is you, it starts to kind of almost filter people out from a socioeconomic, from a, an ecological, from a kind of a genetic disposition point of view. So you end up with a group of kids that usually are still there because it's hard, hard work for them, but they can do it. And also th those kids that are really mobile tend to have an aesthetic um, um, kind of look that perhaps dance schools are looking for. Mm -hmm. So they will... Um, they they'll get chosen, you know. They'll get they'll get picked for the roles. They they'll get you know they'll 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 be kind of um yeah. So oh, what's this? Why is that doing that? Sorry, never mind. My screen just went funny. Anyway, um, so I think um 
the, the thing about hypermobility is that it, so I think the thing maybe in when we're talking about hypermobility, oftentimes we talk about it as a bad thing as something that is not good. But in actual fact, if you're a ballet dancer, then having hypermobility is really, really good for you. Um, you know, because it, it actually allows you to do the thing you want to do. Um, and the problem is, I think, if, 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 if we, we then, in the, in the past, what happened was you just basically bashed yourself. You just danced and danced and danced. And if you, if you weren't, you know, if you weren't, um, um, strong enough, you, you just you just danced a bit more, you know, and and you just kept do, doing it till you were strong enough. Um, things have changed now with regards to the fact that we educate the kids that they have to be strong, they have to as well as being hypermobile, and that that brings issues with it because you're now adding different external loads via weight training to mm -hmm. joints that aren't used to these loads, and so you have to make sure that the you know that the strength and conditioning is done. By a, by a physio that's got strength and conditioning training, or by a or by a proper strength and conditioning fit pro that knows what they're doing, and and a combination of the physio and, and the fit pro has to work together, and that can be really effective. So I think that um, what happens with these guys is I, I there's there's obviously in the literature there's a connection between um, hypermobility and uh, pelvic floor dysfunction. Mm. Um, what I tend to see, what I tend to see really um, in my experience with dancers is that incontinence isn't, so they, they tend to, they don't tend to have a weak pelvic floor. No. They tend to have an overactive pelvic floor. So they tend to have muscles because they stand and turn out a lot, um, especially in ballet. They tend to, tend to stand, all of the posterior pelvic floor is often switched on and they are, anterior pelvic floor can be um, can be um, a little bit under under tension, maybe not so not so switched on. I think is maybe the way to say it. I'm trying to choose my words carefully because I know some of this stuff is not very scientific, but it's kind of and and I think that what happens is um, so we know that continence is when the pressure in your bladder is greater than the pressure in your urethra, and if, you, if the intra-abdominal pressure pushes on that, and then you leak. And stress or momentary increases or a permanent increase, whatever, whatever it is, these guys, um, it's almost like because they are so strong mm -hmm. and because they are functionally able to use their bodies, they can almost overcome those kind of situations where their anterior pelvic floor might be a bit weaker and they've got this imbalance back to front. So I tend to find that um, if you if they come in and you they're the, they're the kind of group, if you really address their posterior pelvic floor, mm -hmm. you tend to make them a bit leaky and you have to go back and retrain the whole of the pelvic floor right. to, to bring it back into line with the, with the, with the balance that wasn't there, really. If that, does that make sense? Absolutely, yeah. Because, yeah. you know, do, do you find that, um, that dancers are becoming more open, like talking about pelvic health issues? Because it's, it's not like going for a run where you can just pad up and get on with it yeah yeah you're right um are they more open about it um i mean would they probably, come, probably they, 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 or do you have to ask directly you know well they, they you know what they know what i do so the th this is the other thing they know what i do in the clinic so i'll probably be the person that would ask them uh it? because i'm kind of i'm just a bit out there and and also you, you get there this is a group of people that you become quite close to because you see them Quite, you, you become, you know, you kind of there's a kind of a family feel about it, really, because you're there a lot, and you're and 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 they're often you're often supporting them on many different levels, psychologically as well as physically. So I, I think that I, I think yeah, they would definitely the relationship I had with the, the the guys when I was there is that if they had a problem, they would speak to me about it. Um, whether or not I get dancers in the clinic, um, speaking to me about it, I would say uh, probably not with, without some prompting. Mm unless they come directly um, for that. And who I'm thinking about is, so we had, um, I, I've had a couple of dancers, uh, professional uh, principal dancers who have just had babies. And um, we've been looking, we've been following them through the process. And so um, you would, we, they, they had just the similar kind of problems that everyone would have um, after we'd had a baby. So it wasn't, they were any better or any worse. What they were is quite quick to pick up on the fact of what you were trying to get them to do. So, you know, whereas it might take a couple of sessions with somebody, with these guys, you just say, do this. And you say to them, tighten up your uh, pubic coccygeus, please. 
how's that? Yeah, that's it. Thanks very much. Because they just, I mean, they just have this amazing connection. Mind, they have, they're have they really embodied with themselves. And so they, they just kind of go there. So I think, yeah, I mean, I, I think, uh, yeah, that, that that's, I, I think the my guys would probably see it, <clears throat> probably in the clinic a bit less. One way around that, of course, <clears throat> is the use of um, questionnaires that actually have questions that ask those, so they don't actually have to verbalise it to you. And so if I have a dancer that I perhaps can, maybe I think they've got some issue going on, uh, and, maybe, and I'm getting a feeling, but I, I'm also getting the feeling that they're going, don't you dare ask me, then I'm, <laughs> I might get them to fill the questionnaire in and then at the next time they come, I would say, listen, I looked at your questionnaire and I saw you, you, you noted this. Did you want to maybe tell me a little bit more about that? Or, and they might then say, you know, it's, it's all, that, that's when you're kind of saying things like, I, I was talking to a dancer yesterday saying, you know, uh, she's got some vulvodynia and some incontinence she's, and she's coming to see, coming to the clinic. And I just said, like, do you want to see me or do you want to see Elaine uh, Walpole? It doesn't, it doesn't matter. I mean, I, I'm happy it's up to yourself but you know just to get that kind of conversation out there about what's it, what because i say you know it might entail an internal exam so i just want you to understand that that might be a possibility so it's just kind of communication really and being being as clear as you can yeah, yeah. is I'm, I'm kind of just thinking as as you're talking <coughs> so with kind of intra-abdominal pressure management and i'm thinking particularly you know, of lifts of jumps yeah um, mm -hmm. and then postpartum as well do you see yep. much of an issue in terms of pelvic organ prolapse and like you know, in terms of managing that? Well, or is it because they no, are such elite athletes, you know, they have pressure management, yeah. breath control? So it, I suppose I, I, the, the simple answer is no, right. I don't see a lot, don't see a lot of it. But if you look at the literature, yeah. There is, there's, there's, there's evidence in the literature that in elite level athlete groups that there is a uh, pelvic organ prolapse, prolapse. And I think perhaps with dancers, um, one of the things is when you're on stage, you have to breathe properly. Mm. And I'm a big believer that breathing is a massive, you know, force to be reckoned with when it comes to pelvic organ prolapse. And these guys, they can't be in an arabesque position and not be breathing properly because their belly will stick out. So they have, and they don't want that. They want this flat abdomen with a nice aesthetic line. And so I think the big thing that dancers tend to do is they tend to be pretty good at breathing. <clears throat> and, and, it, the, and the ones that aren't pretty good at breathing are usually so uh, contracted in their pelvic floor that nothing's gonna come out of there. <laughs> you know, it's, I, I think it's something, and I, know, I don't know if we've not really done the research to look at what happens to dancers when they stop dancing, mm. if they ever do, because the principal dancers that I know that have left Scottish Ballet are still, who have had children, have had no um, pelvic floor issues. Uh, well, that's not true. They, and certainly have no ongoing pelvic floor issues. Let's say that everything's been repaired, sorted and back to normal and they're still dancing with no issues. So I, I don't really see that. And I, I mean, I know it's reported. Um, I, it tends to be more kind of athletes, you know, like powerlifters and uh, people that are doing kind of much more kind of sustained um sustained uh, loading rather than because the other thing about ballet is that although it what we see with ballet is lots of photographs of girls standing still and ballet is not about being still it's about moving right and i think i think as soon as you get into a movement type situation yeah. because everything's dynamic and it's all working um to support things i think we get less of that yeah i, th I think that's that's my theory but i could be wrong in there bill Oh, geez. <laughs> Steady. Yeah. <laughs> Do you find then, you know, in terms of menstrual health, you know, are, are a lot of the dancers, the female dancers, obviously, um, you know, is, are they all, you know, are they using oral contraceptives to control their cycles? Or is that kind of on the radar in terms of issues like red S and menstrual irregularities? Because I'm thinking down the line, in terms of, of bone health, fertility, but even injury. Yeah. <clears throat>